Our sermon text for this morning is John chapter 21, verses 20 through 25. And the scripture reading will also be on the screen, so you can follow along there as well. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. This is God's word. You may be seated. Well, as we come now to the Bible, let's bow our heads in prayer together. Let's pray. Lord, may we feast with manna from heaven, your food, your spiritual food. May we delight in your fountain of life, the work of your Holy Spirit. And in your light, may we see light. Help us, Lord, to understand and believe. And so follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, as we come now, as uh, uh, Josh Mout has uh, already said, to the end of this series in the book of John, it's uh, been a series that's cut off into different uh, uh, mini-series. We come now to the end of the book of John. John has been calling us to believe and to live, and uh, he has been calling us to follow Jesus. And so right at the beginning of John's gospel, uh, when Jesus is calling his first disciples, John chapter 1, verse 43, he says to Philip, follow me. And now we come to the end of John's gospel, and that issue of following Jesus is rooted in John's claim that this is a true testimony. This is something you can rely upon. But of course, the question that we ask today is, is it? Is it really a true testimony? Uh, many people today uh, think the Bible is not reliable, and if they are interested in following Jesus, the Bible is not the first place many people would turn to. If you're familiar with social media, uh, you will know that Twitter, when it sees a tweet that it does not agree with, will stamp on that tweet this claim is disputed. And many people today, when they hear a preacher like me say, follow Jesus through the words of the Bible, would in their mind stamp underneath that claim, uh, that statement, this claim is disputed. Is this really a reliable testimony? Arthur Schopenhauer, the 19th century uh, German philosopher, said that uh, all truth goes through three stages. Uh, the first stage is that it is ridiculed. The second stage is that it is violently opposed. And the third stage is that it is accepted as self-evident. 
Well, Schopenhauer would know because during his lifetime, his philosophy was not widely accepted. Uh, but by the time it came to Einstein, the great scientist, Einstein viewed Schopenhauer as the greatest of philosophers. This claim is disputed or opposed or ridiculed. In fact, we might add to Schopenhauer's three stages a fourth one today, which is there is no ultimate truth. All we have are what is called our own lived experiences. But any claim that Jesus is Lord and that we are to follow Him and not other gods, other paths, and that His claim on our life morally has ultimate authority, any claim like that, for many people today, they have, as it were, like the Twitter stamp on a tweet that is not viewed as uh, true, this claim is disputed. And of course, it's very, very important. Uh, I find this pastorally. People grow up in a church like this, and they hear a preacher might, like me taught about the Bible and following Jesus, but then they step outside of the church walls, and they come across people who do not believe that the Bible is authoritative, and they've never had a good answer given. And they are like sheep before wolves. You yourself may be uh, wondering whether you can really follow Jesus according to the Bible. And certainly all of us have many contacts who would say this claim is disputed. Well, let's look at how John uh, finishes his gospel and says that, no, indeed, this is a true testimony. The story begins in verse 20. As we've seen, uh, Peter is walking along with Jesus uh, on the seashore. He's walking on the beach. Uh, he's just heard from Jesus that following uh, Jesus means um, self-sacrifice, and I think we can assume there's something of a quiet reflection going on. And as they walk together along the beach, Peter, I think, hears a noise behind him. He hears the crunch, crunch, crunch of someone else walking behind, and he turns around and sees John. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. It's all about following here with this true testimony that John is given, giving. Peter is following Jesus, and now John is also following Jesus. Uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved is John's, the author of this gospel's characteristic way of describing himself. He doesn't say, my name is John. He calls himself by the third person, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And this is part of the true testimony. What John is saying is that the written words of John's gospel, and by extension the rest of the New Testament, and by further extension the rest of the Bible, the written words of John's gospel are put down by someone who knew Jesus personally, who followed him personally, who was a friend of Jesus. And of course, that means it's a reliable testimony. If you read a biography of someone, uh, you want to know the person who writes the biography actually knew the person about whom he is writing. And what John is saying is, I knew him very well. I was his close personal friend. You can trust what I write. And therefore, you can trust that this is a reliable testimony. But there's another lesson there as well, which is even more personal, which is that if Jesus had friends, so should we. Do you have a friend? I find pastorally many men in particular just do not have friends. Oh, they're friendly, but a friend is someone you can let your guard down with, you can share your heart with, 
without judgment or criticism. You can be straightforward with. You're not selling your personality anymore. It's just who you are with all your confusion and brokenness and happiness and joy. But a friend, do you have a friend? I know different cultures uh, make friendships in different ways. In my own cultural background in England, uh, men of my generation, when they have a good friend and they really want to talk, will go out to the pub and sit down and have a beer together, and it's a cultural cue that now we're really going to talk. Uh, a man of my generation will say, hey, let's grab a beer. And what that means is, I need to talk. Happens in different ways in different cultures. Uh, the uh, culture that uh, I served in as a missionary, I was very struck by the depth of their friendships. When a person was late to an important meeting, a business meeting, a ministry meeting, an important meeting, and he turned up late, as was uh, fairly common in that culture, the person would give this excuse quite often, my friend needed me. And when I looked around the room of other people from that culture, once that person said that, my friend needed me, no questions were asked. It was a sufficient reason to be late to a business meeting. My friend needed me. Do you have a friend? There are predictors of spiritual health. The number one predictor is trusting this reliable testimony. The number two predictor is a real spiritual godly friend. Do you have a friend? Next time someone offers you a hand of friendship, let's grab a coffee, let's go for a walk, the weather's getting better, you can walk outside, let's go for a walk and a talk. Next time someone offers you that, don't resist it. We all need friends. Jesus did. Jesus had a friend. We should have a friend too. So the one whom Jesus loved is uh, writing this, and therefore we can trust it because John knew Jesus very well. He was his friend. But then, verse 21, uh, Peter saw John. He said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, what Jesus is saying, and it's a, a great um, lesson that the Bible has witnesses, true testimonies that are multiple. And again, that is a reason why we can trust it. There are two or three and actually four gospel witnesses for who Jesus really is. Matthew, Mark, who reflects almost certainly Peter's testimony, um, uh, Luke and, and John. It's a different perspective, a different angle on Jesus, but the same Jesus. And therefore, you can, you can trust that reliable testimony. It's not mono, monocultural. It's not monochrome. It's not monopersonality. It's not biased. There are multiple testimonies. It's Peter, and there's, uh, and there's John here. But again, there's also a personal and practical lesson in our discipleship, our following of Jesus. It's very tempting, isn't it, as those of us who do follow Jesus, to spend too much time, an inordinate amount of time, wondering how other people are doing in their discipleship or their following of Jesus. But Peter, that's not your job. It's not your job to wonder how John is doing. It's not your job to wonder how someone else's Bible study is going. It's not your job to determine whether someone else is sound or not. It's not your job to interfere with someone else's ministry. It's not your job to wonder whether someone else is giving enough money to the kingdom. It's not your job to decide whether someone else is doing the right thing. You. Peter, you follow me. That's a very important lesson for all of us. I've been reflecting on that quite a bit this week. Obviously, I'm a senior pastor of a large church, 
and therefore there are many ministries over which I have some degree of responsibility, but I have different levels of involvement. Some ministries I drive, the pulpit I drive, I'm directly involved. Other ministries I merely uh, oversee or I direct more generally. And then there are many ministries, people from other churches or other organizations who call me up and send me an email and say, what do you think about this? And my job is not to get involved, but to support and encourage. Peter, don't worry about John. You follow me. And uh, so that multiplicity of perspective gives us confidence that the Bible is reliable. It's a true testimony. But then look what happens, verse 23. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers, uh, this was talked about all over the place, that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Well, again, classically, isn't it? One of the reasons why people put a stamp on the Bible, this claim is disputed, is because there are so many different interpretations of the Bible. And people say to themselves, who am I meant to believe? Am I meant to believe this interpretation or that interpretation? All these different sayings that spread abroad, and that perhaps makes you think, how can I actually understand the Bible? It all seems too complicated. There are all these scholars with doctorates and books they've written and all the rest. And as far as I can see, they don't even agree among themselves. So how am I meant to understand? There are all these different sayings that are spread abroad. Well, of course, the answer is given here. How do you really understand? Do you really understand by going back to the source, by what Jesus actually said? So as John puts it, yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? In other words, the first principle of Bible interpretation is actually to read the Bible for yourself and to go back to what it says, to what Jesus said. If you're an academic, that means not relying on secondary literature only, but going back to the primary literature, that is the Bible. And for all of us, it means not just listening to sermons about the Bible, but actually having the Bible open ourselves as we listen to those sermons, not just reading devotionals that are tangentially related to things that come out of the Bible, but actually going to the Bible ourselves. Not listening to the sayings that are spread abroad, but what Jesus actually said. And when you do that, you find it's a reliable testimony. And so John moves on to that theme, then verse 24. This is the disciple, that is John. Again, he's talking about himself in the third person. This is the disciple who is bearing witness, or that word witness is the same as the word testimony, who is bearing testimony or witness about these things, and who has written these things, obviously uh, John's gospel. And we know that his testimony or witness, same word, is true. It's a true testimony. So what John is saying is this is the disciple whom Jesus loved, who was close to Jesus, who knew Jesus personally, who walked with Jesus along that beach and sat next to him and leant back against him at that last supper, who knew Jesus personally. This is the one who's writing these things and therefore it is a reliable true testimony. Now, what does he mean when he says, we know that his testimony is true? Almost certainly, John is again talking about himself. So when he says, this is the disciple who is bearing witness, he means himself. And when he says, we know, he's saying he himself knows. He's writing about himself. And what he's saying is, I am giving testimony that this is true. This is what Jesus said. I was there, and it is a reliable 
testimony. And therefore, to underline that, he concludes with a rhetorical flourish, with uh, a little bit of hyperbole or exaggeration. Verse 25, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that will be written. Well, that is hyperbole, isn't it? It's, it's an exaggeration, but it's an exaggeration for a point. So one um, well-known, renowned John scholar, in personal conversation with me, he didn't put it in any of his books yet, as far as I know, because I think he was still thinking about it. It hadn't yet appeared in his books. Maybe he has since our conversation. But uh, he told me that in his estimate, John was so selective in his choice of material to put into his gospel that one-third, a whole third, one-third of everything that Jesus did in his ministry. So Jesus' ministry was about three years, and in this scholar's estimate, one year in total out of those three years is not recorded. It's an astonishing thought, isn't it? One year out of those three years is not recorded. So though it's exaggeration and hyperbole, he's making a point. What John is saying is, there's a lot more I could have written. But I was very selective with what I chose to write down. And I selected it to show you in every possible way that Jesus is Lord, that you may believe Him, and so find life, and be persuaded that this is a reliable testimony. So it is um, a true testimony. Now, uh, many people, as we said at the beginning, uh, dispute this. This claim is disputed. How can we instead say, using the Twitter analogy, not this claim is disputed, but instead verified account, that little blue check mark, verified account. Uh, the older criticisms of the Bible uh, tend to have said that the Bible is made up of many different sources that have editorially been put together over many years and therefore you cannot rely on it. But the people who write like that, <laughs> if you use the same techniques that they use for the Bible, you can conclude that their own books are also written by many different people over many different times. Different styles development of thought. I had one friend once who was asked to write how the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, or Isaiah, as I believe it is pronounced around here, the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament uh, was um, actually written over a long period of time, one of the standard theories of Isaiah in critical um, liberal thought, liberal theologically uh, thought, that the book of Isaiah is actually three Isaiahs, and he decided to have a bit of fun during his examinations, his theological examinations at the university in Cambridge. And so he decided instead to write how there were not really three Isaiahs, there were ten. He got top grades. There's no end to that approach. You can use that same approach to prove that each of those authors who say that the Bible has many different authors are themselves not single authors, but many different authors. If you want to follow that further, a good uh, source of that, a good discussion of that is uh, Beale and Carson's Hermeneutics, Authority, and Canon, if you want to follow that technically. More commonly today, it is said that actually um, the interpretation of the Bible is entirely subjective. Uh, this is a theory that used to be called reader response theory. It's the reader and their response shapes the interpretation. And in this view, my own lived experience as a part of a particular group shapes the meaning of the text, the meaning of the Bible. 
And so if I'm Asian, I have an Asian interpretation. If I am, um, what am I? I suppose I'm 30% Scots-Irish on one side of my family and 30% Scots-Irish on, on the other and about 40% Anglo-Saxon. That then, and my background, means that I have that approach to the meaning. And the meaning of the text, therefore, is radically multiplied, and there's no one claim. But of course, the trouble with that approach is, again, you can do the same thing with the people who make that claim about the text. When someone says that I believe there are many different interpretations to the, the Bible, and there is no one interpretation, you can come back to that person making that claim there are many different interpretations with many different interpretations of their claim that there are many different interpretations. If you want to follow that further, a good text of that is Kevin Van Hooser's Is There a Meaning in This Text? No, there are, of course, different applications. We've seen that. Uh, John and Peter needed to follow Jesus in their own personality, in their own way. There are many different applications, and we do need to have a nuanced view of application to different cultures and different backgrounds. I hope we have that as a church. But there is one Lord, and there's one faith, and we all, in our own personalities, our own culture, need to apply that truth so that we then follow Him as the Lord. It's a true testimony. And of course, these things are complicated. As Oscar Wilde once said, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. But this is a reliable testimony. Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian author, in the end of his Nobel Prize winning speech, he said, one word of truth will outweigh the world. And we who follow Jesus, we follow Jesus according to this reliable, true testimony. And what that means is, you have a rock. You have a solid foundation, a firm foundation. You have someone to base your life upon. And therefore, read the Bible, believe the Bible, share the Bible, this true testimony, and so follow Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord God, we do uh, thank You that uh, this testimony is true, and we pray, Lord, that uh, we would follow Your leading through Your Word, Your Gospel. And we thank You, Lord. We bow before You with great uh, joy and gratitude than a time of upheaval and confusion in our world, we have a solid word. We have a reliable, true testimony. And when we face tomorrow with all its confusions and uncertainties, we can turn to John's gospel and know that we have a true testimony and we can follow you. Lord, we don't know the future, but we know You hold the future in Your hand. We don't have all the answers, Lord, but we know You do. And so we follow You. In Jesus' name, amen.